Hello, and this section we are going to be looking at Ransom, page 80 to page 90. Um, or actually, technically, it's the bottom of page 79. Um, so that basically is, we're just following on from um, Priam has had this idea to go and ransom his son's body. Um, and he is convinced his wife, or sort of convinced his wife, Hecuba, based on putting forward his arguments and then um, retelling his story of when he was a young boy and became a slave and then was ransomed uh, or restored back to his role as king or prince of um, Troy. And he, uh, Hecuba kind of gives up arguing with him and uh, brings in the rest of the sons and the wisest, wisest um, advisors. And, um, and so this section is like the family meeting. The title for this section is family meeting. And you can imagine, like I picture all of the royal family, you know, when you're having a family meeting around the kitchen table. But this, obviously, there's 50 of them or thereabouts. Um, so there's quite a lot of them. Anyway, let's start. So they've got a family meeting and there is a, um, a description of the princes. Some of them, or nine of them, are Hecuba's sons. The rest of them belong to other women or they're bastards. So they're, so Priam has a number of wives, now Hecuba being the main one, but then there's other princesses and other women who aren't married to him as well. Once there used to be 50 sons, okay, but they're not all um, alive still because many of them have died in the war. He says the ones who are left are heroes of the table and of the dance, good eaters and good dancers. They are plumped, uh, plump and soft bellies. So the fighters have both basically all died, um, is the implication anyway, in the conflict with Troy, I mean, with the Greeks. And so for the ones who are left, um, other than Hellenus, who is the priest, is the, um, they're divided, there's factions, um, all watchful of one another. And then if they're not divided of another, it's because of politics and some to do with their wives and their bickering and their rivalry. Um, and the wives are afraid of Hecuba and the princes think how funny it is because at home their wives are demanding, all powerful, but they go to water when Hecuba, this small straight back to women, puts discern, uh, disconcerting questions. <clears throat> Today, um, there is a few, I don't know how to say these Greek names, I could probably look them up, but I'm just trying to summarize the main key points for you, so I won't bother. Um, Priam stands isolated and very nearly forgotten, which is quite interesting. And then um, one of the sons, Polydorus, or Polydorus, I have no idea, um, who's a young child, who or childlike, little more than a child, greets his father, and then one by one they greet the father. Um, and they then hear what he has in mind. So he tells them their story, and they are filled with misgiving, and it swells, and questions spread, and they are challenging. It contradicts everything they have ever known this new idea. Um, so this king whose stable is the envy of every prince in the known world does not ride in a wagon drawn by mules. Note the italics there to show the derogatory feeling about the mules the lower status. King does not, in his own person, negotiate and deal. He has a herald to do that. Okay, so they are all protesting, all astir, they're protesting, but none of them is willing to be the first one to speak. Dephobus, the most smooth-mannered and eloquent, addresses him as, my dear lord. Notice the royal way of addressing the father there. Yes, we met... Hector was so important. There's all lots of persuasion, but 
This plan is new and unheard of and it puts your precious life at risk and it exposes... Krishtek Griol, could you please come to the office? Krishtek Griol, packed up to the office, please. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, it exposes to insult and this is as valued every bit as much as life itself. This is interesting. This is, again, referring to this symbolic nature of the role of king. And this section, other than being the family meeting, is really probably the one where this dual nature of the king is debated and referred to the most. So you can really be talking about the dual nature and the fact that the symbolism of the um, identity of king is really important. <clears throat> so the Achilles, they say, would take delight in hauling down the kingly image and dragging that too to the dust. So what would happen if the image of king were to be mistreated just like Hector's body? Um, you are a treasure. The king, the role of king is the treasure and we cannot allow that to be lost. So they first start to persuade um, you can't have anything to do with ordinary desires and needs and feelings. I know you know that and they're not unknown to you, but they are not in your royal sphere. And that's a quote that's used a couple of times as well throughout the novel. Um, so be patient, okay? Hector's not gonna thank you for going and begging in a human way and lay the glory of Troy into the dust. He would weep, like Hector wouldn't thank you for this. Um, and then Priam responds, whoa. Okay, so Priam responds and Priam says, look, I know you have spoken to me as a son, so um, I'm sorry if I'm offending you, but I've had a good 60 years now to think about what it means to be king, the splendour and limitations. Um, and here he really talks about reconcile that ring of that role of king. And you want me to stand at a kingly distance, which my kingly role, okay, that I can have no, no part of real life or ordinary life, but I am also a father, that dual role of king and father. Okay, come on, isn't it time now for me to understand what it means to be merely human? I know I'm an old man, feeble in body, ill-equipped to go out venturing into this life, but I am also stubborn and I have a certain degree of toughness. Okay, now is the time to show it. Cassandra's there, but her God is now not speaking to her, no longer visits her. She is grief, so, you know, numb with grief for Hector. And so she can't really respond. Um, and finally, Polydemus, who is not even a son or a son-in-law, but he is a wise advisor. And he speaks again on behalf of the Trojans, saying, you know, I've always admired Hector, and, um, but, you know, we, we have a limit in what we have a right to ask, and the gods too can demand. They made you a king, a proper kingliness of spirit and presence is all that they or we can require of you. So he's referring to the kingliness of spirit. And implying that the action of going to ransom the king doesn't, uh, the, the body of Hector doesn't match that. So don't expose yourself, spare yourself this old deal, be kind to your old age. Okay. And then Priam responds, saying, look, you have been generous. So there's all lots of fawning and lots of polite words, really. Uh, but Priam now responds and says, look, I'm, gonna, I'm rejecting your advice, but it's not because I don't value you. I value you because you are my son's friends and you're also wise. It's true, God, the gods made me a king but they also made me a man and mortal. They give me life and all that's sweet, all that's terrible too, so all that's good and bad have come from the gods. Okay, And the gods know nothing of losing something sweet. Okay? They don't know anything about this mortal life. Okay, uh, But as humans, death is inevitable. Okay, When we come to the end, Every heartbeat, every moment of our lives has been slowly walking towards death. 
Okay? Only we humans can know because we are mortal, but the gods can't know that. And all this happens, so death happens. What's so bad if I go and die? Okay? One day comes, there's a strength. That one day war comes, there's a strength, nerve, and an old man has no part to play in war. Okay? And he talks about the fact that, look, if this goes badly, the citadels might come, the Greeks could take over um, and loot our city and the dogs could claw at each other's backs to get to the entrails of the stomach and all this could happen with the Greeks. Okay? And yes, one of the concerns of a good king is the image he presents and the image that, that he will have after he's gone, but he's concerned about the image when he's gone in these last days of kingship. He says he can't stop whatever if the Greeks are going to invade or not. Okay. He must leave that to the gods. And if the last thing that happens is to be hunted, dragged out, stripped and humiliated, then so be it. Okay, if that's going to happen, then that's you know, going to happen. But he wants the image in the minds of men to be a living one of something so new. So this action that he's going to take to ransom Hector and Hector's body is so new and so unprecedented that he wants that to be like his legacy. And so I've written legacy on my notes there, that it's the legacy he's going to, oh, there we go, legacy he's going to leave. So when people and men speak my name, it will stand proof. This act, even an old man can perform. Maybe an old man can't go to war, but an old man can ransom, can go. In fact, an old man, only an old da man dare perform, okay, who can go humbly as a father and as a man, so not as a king, but as a father and a man to his son's killer, and ask in the God's name to be given back the body of his dead son. In case the, lest, in case the honour of all men be trampled to the dust. Okay. And Priam's voice breaks. Everybody is moved. They see there is no point arguing any more. This is a foolish plan, but they can, they have to let him have his way. So they basically all agree to this plan. And that's the end of the family meeting section, which goes to page 90. Awesome. <laughs>